Our Father, we thank you for the study of tonight. We thank you for the Bible. We thank you for the Holy Ghost that leads us into the truth. We're asking that tonight, again, you lead us into your truth in Jesus' name. Amen. We're asking us that as we study verse upon verse and various references in the Bible, that your word will be implanted in our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. And this word will be hidden in our hearts so that at the time of need, the Holy Ghost will be able to bring out the appropriate passage from our hearts which will lead us into victory that very time in Jesus' name. Amen. Guide us in our study. Lead each one of us into truth relevant to our growth where we are right now. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Our study through the Acts of the Apostles has been slow, deliberately so. It will be easy for just um, any preacher, any teacher to come and study perhaps about three chapters together in a day. Point out the important, uh, what he counts as important verses. Because the teacher or the preacher might be in a hurry to finish up in time and um, to go to another book. But you know, actually, whenever you are before the Lord, you must be patient. Because the Lord might have a lot to tell you in a single verse, in a single chapter that will turn your life around, change your life, and uh, just make you what you ought to be. And if the Lord will make you to stay 40 days upon one single mountain, one single chapter, like Moses stayed 40 days right on that mountain, and he looked at the face of God, until when he came down, the glory of the Lord was shining upon his face. That would be all right. Rather than want to be in, on 40 mountains in 40 days. And never get the glimpse of the glory from the face of the Lord. So that perhaps explains why we've been going steadily and slowly. Chapter by chapter, verse by verse. So that we'll stay long enough in a particular place that will be able to get a good view of uh, the glory of the Lord. And I believe that as we go through, the glory of the Lord will be upon us as we study in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I've told you before that um, Acts of the Apostles is the authentic history of the church that really we have to read. Many of the writers that have written about church history after the end of the New Testament uh, from the time of um, the second century AD up till the present time. Some of them have wrote, have written the truth by and large, mixed with some misconception. And you know that no writer after the close of the New Testament can actually write with the same illumination or the same inspiration of the Holy Ghost like those who wrote the New Testament books. And so the only book of church history that we're very sure about that was written with the mind of God, with the mind of Christ, with the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, without any error whatever, is this which we're studying at the present moment. And it pays us a lot for our own personal growth, family growth, and uh, church growth to get into this book of Acts and get the best that God has for us in the book. Now, before the Lord went away, he said in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, But ye shall receive power, after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, unto the uttermost part of the earth. Now, you know from this that Jesus Christ himself had outlined the preaching of the gospel, or if you like, the evangelization of the world. He had given the gospel. In Matthew he said, go into all the world, or sorry, uh, go to all nations and make disciples of all nations. Preach the gospel to them, teaching all nations, and uh, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And he said, Behold, or lo, I am with you until the end of the world. In Mark, he had said that uh, they go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. 
He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. And in Luke he had said that the repentance should be preached in all nations. And they should teach her all that he had told them. In John he had said, As the Father sent me, so have I sent you. And in Acts he made point upon point. And he made a deliberate outline. And he said, As we are preaching the gospel, in obedience to the great commission, you'll do it in Jerusalem, you'll do it in Judea, you'll do it in Samaria, you'll do it unto the uttermost part of the earth. I know you knew that before. You heard that before, but be patient. God is a God of order. You know, sometimes when we have the Holy Ghost upon us and we believe that the Lord has raised us up to do something for the Lord, we just suddenly become impatient and disorderly. And we do not understand that whenever the Lord is giving out his commission, he wants orderliness. And you want to see from here what Jesus had said. He said, do it in Jerusalem. Do it in Judea. Do it in Samaria. And then eventually you will not stop until you come to the uttermost part of the earth. I find that many Christians today, they are so much in a hurry and they are impatient. They don't want to do anything in Jerusalem where they are where they got the experience, where they met the Lord, where they know and where they are known. They don't even want to do anything in the surrounding, in Judea or in Samaria. They want to immediately go to the uttermost part of the earth. But you know, as we read the history of the church, and we see how the Lord himself commissioned the people, and he sent out the people, and the work was done a step at a time, in an orderly fashion, We get a lot today. In verse 4, he said, being assembled together with them, he commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem. Let them stay there. But wait for the promise of the Father, which says he, ye have heard of me. And in obedience, they were there in Jerusalem. And it was there in Jerusalem, the power came upon them. And they labored in Jerusalem. Labored in Jerusalem until in chapter 5 of Acts of the Apostles verse 28 saying did not we strictly command you that you should not teach in this name and behold ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us they had a base a strong base you know what uh, the builder does when he wants to build a strong house he develops a strong base. You know what the businessman does when he wants to carry out a business that he wants to circle the whole of the nation? He develops a strong base and headquarters, if you like. You know what a politician does when he wants to campaign all over the nation? He starts in a place, in a strong place, and he makes a strong base, a strong foundation. You know what the apostles did when the power came upon them? In Acts chapter 2, they did something something wise and it was deliberate and it was uh, led by the Holy Ghost and if we're going to do anything substantial for the Lord today we should take note and do exactly the same thing they stayed in Jerusalem and on that day when the power came upon them as the power came uh, then they saw that 3,000 were converted but then what were they to do were there to leave 3,000 babies behind and rush and say, well, we're in a hurry. We need to get to Judea in time. We need to get to Samaria in time. We need to get to the uttermost part of the earth in time. No, not at all. Develop a strong base. And so they just stayed in Jerusalem. And for those 3,000 people that believed, we're told those people continued in the apostles' doctrine. And it touched them and touched them and touched them so that they will grow, so that they will become matured, until even the enemies of the gospel were saying, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine. After all, if uh, they were going to do anything in Judea, anything in Samaria, the people that were going to do that, the workers, the deacons, the ministers, the evangelists, the pastors, the teachers, they need themselves to have grown and to have been matured. And that was the work they were doing in Jerusalem. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, there are young people that receive the call of God. Now, if you are a member of a um, deeper life Bible church, 
it's wonderful you are here but you know there are some people who are not members of this church but then they come on a Monday like this and actually they are receiving a call from God and they need to understand how they will carry out the work that the Lord is committing into their hands and if such a person is here be patient and listen to me now you may say, well, you are not uh, of deeper Christian life ministry. Oh yes, but you belong to God. You are a child of God. And God is calling you and you are here tonight. You want to know you'll be able to make a success of whatever the Lord is calling you to do. Now listen. The temptation is this, that immediately you, you receive the call of God. Immediately you say, God is calling me and God has given you perhaps the name of your church, the name of the new ministry that is to come up, the name of the thing that is to be done. You know what you do? The temptation is this. You just rise up, you do a little in Lagos, a little at Ibadan. You begin to go all about saying that, well, I have a work to do. God has given me a great vision. I'm going to the uttermost part of the earth. Well, are you not studying the Bible? That they developed a strong base somewhere? And if the Lord is calling you, stay somewhere. Get the work done. And it may look slow. It looks slow when those apostles, all the twelve of them, they remained in Jerusalem. And they were just line upon line, precept upon precept. And they were developing the lives of the people until they filled Jerusalem with the doctrine. Anybody could have been opposing them, saying, well, they're wasting a lot of time here. They are all these 12 apostles. They just keep themselves here. They knew what they were doing. You understand? The New Testament wasn't written yet. And um, if they were going to do anything, they must have a strong base, a strong foundation. And that they did. And then the persecution came. Come on to Acts chapter 8. I'm reading verse 1. And Saul was consenting unto his death, talking unto of the death of Stephen. And at that time there was a great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of, what's the next word? Tell me out loud. That's exactly the plan of Jesus Christ. You know, according to plan, it's in order. You feel Jerusalem with your doctrine. Now go on phase two of the program. And if phase two of the program is Judea. And then it says, and uh, what's the next word? Samaria. It's right on line. Right on line. And you can see that it was just according to the purpose of God. You say, how about the uttermost part of the earth? Wait a step at a time. That's the mistake we make. Now let me talk to you. When you receive the Holy Ghost, He begins to share with you visions of what you will do. But you understand that when you receive the Holy Ghost and the Holy Spirit is leading you, there are times that the Holy Spirit is not leading and it is just the human spirit. Not evil spirit. Not evil spirit, human spirit. You are a child of God. The Holy Ghost has given you that vision, that revelation. Jerusalem first, then Judea, then Samaria, then unto the uttermost part of the earth. Then if you are not careful, if you are not a member of deeper life, listen to me, let me help you. If God has called you, I'm uh, separating these people because, you know, if you are a member of deeper Christian life ministry, normally you will seek for counseling. Normally you will come according to the word of God that says you listen to those who are put over you, who are watching over your soul. But I should, in case we have a person here tonight who is not a member of this church and the Lord is calling him and uh, he doesn't know that he needs to come for counseling. Now, you know, your human spirit will begin to compare uh, with, uh, you know, I know that deeper like Bible church over there. And they have, gone, uh, they have gone to Ghana, they have gone to Cameroon, they have gone to the Gambia, they have gone to Kenya. And uh, what God did through them, he can do through me. You are right, but a step at a time. Don't be in a hurry. Whatever God wants to do through you, he will do it. If you are patient. And uh, you know, your human spirit will brush the Holy Spirit aside and your human spirit will say, uttermost part of the earth, uttermost part of the earth, uttermost part of the earth. And you'll just be trotting about. You'll go away from Jerusalem without the work in Jerusalem being solidified. You'll go away from uh, Judea and Samaria without the work in Samaria and Judea being solidified. And you'll go to the uttermost part of the earth premature. You know, in the history of the early church, they didn't do that. They didn't do that. 
a step at a time. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 9, I'm reading verse 31. Acts chapter 9, verse 31. Verse 31. Then at the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, and they were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. Churches had been established by the time um, of what we're going to study today. Churches had been established in Judea, all Judea, all Judea. There were churches there, there were pastors there. Good network of church administration. And all Galilee and all Samaria, there were churches there. And the churches were walking in the fear of the Lord. They were not immature, they were not carnal, they were not wishy-washy, they were not babies. They were walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost. And the ministers that were put in those churches in uh, Judea, Galilee, and Samaria, uh, they were doing the work well. The pastors, uh, they just knew how the church will grow. They knew how to teach and they knew how to pastor, how to shepherd. And now after that, come back to Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Now listen. What God wants you to do, you will do it. If you are walking in deeper life, you've heard me say that before. No need to push the person in front of you down and tread upon him, crush him with your boot. There is no need to brush other people aside and disregard every other person. What God wants you to do, you will do. Where God wants you to go, you will go. Where he wants you to minister, eventually you will minister. Just follow God a step at a time. They were in Jerusalem and the work had been done. And their testimony, and even all people around them, they had this testimony that Jerusalem was filled with the doctrine. And also the same thing had been done in Judea, had been done in Samaria. And churches, lively churches, dynamic churches, growing churches were established in those places. And now the time comes in the timetable of God that they will go to the uttermost part of the earth. You know that language? You know what it means? It's not just talking about distance. Because if you understood the Jews very well, and um, the apostles of the early church, I mean those 12 apostles of Jesus Christ, they were Jews. The believers in Jerusalem in the early church, they were Jews. And all the people that had taken the gospel to Judea and Samaria, they were Jews. If you know the Jews, if you knew the Jews of those days, if you were five miles away, five kilometers away, and you were a Gentile, you could as well be in the uttermost part of the earth. They will not talk to you. They will not preach to you. They had nothing to do with you. There was a long distance. It wasn't just a distance measured by miles or measured by kilometers. It was a, it was a distance measured by their religious and uh, background and uh, their cultural bigotry. They were far, far away. But Jesus had told them that eventually when the time comes and the timetable of the Lord, you will reach those people of the uttermost part of the earth. And now the time came. You remember, we we'll spent some weeks on Acts chapter 10. That gentle uh, man, Cornelius, had seen an angel. And the angel sort of was saying, now the time had come, you send to Joppa and you'll find a man there that is called Simon Peter. He's living in the house of one Tana, of uh, one Simon, a Tana. And then he described the house by the side of the sea. You ask for Simon Peter there, he will come and tell you words, words of the full gospel that you need to hear. And um, they went, and at the same time, God was uh, showing a trance, a vision, a revelation unto Peter. And he was saying, Arise, Peter, and kill and eat. And Peter replied and said, No, not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. The voice spake unto him again the second time, What God has cleansed, that call not common. Call thou not common. This was done thrice, that is three times, and the vessel was received up again into heaven. 
while Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean, behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made inquiry of, for Simon's house and stood before the gate and called and asked whether Simon, which was surnamed Peter, were lodged there. While Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. And that was the thing that brought Peter and Cornelius together. These three people came. And eventually, Peter listened to them, and he told them to wait until the morrow, until the following day. And while he was going, he chose six men along with him, and he got to Cornelius' house. Now, you know the story already. Cornelius uh, approached him, and rehearsed or related the vision that he saw, the vision of the angel, unto Peter again. And then um, said, we're all here. And uh, we're here present before God to hear all things that are commanded thee of God. And Peter opened his mouth and he began to talk to them. And as he talked in verse 44 of Acts chapter 10, while Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. I told you before, that um, the Holy Ghost does not come upon a dirty vessel. Now, you remember that the Holy Ghost is part of the Godhead and is high and holy, clean and without spot. And whatever you know of God the Father, whatever you know of Jesus Christ, you know also of the Holy Ghost. The same in power, the same in purity, the same in action, the same in everything, and it certainly is divine. And you know when a king and a great a guest is coming into a house, what do you do in that house? You know, if you were just expecting that, you were expecting a person that was just great and had been living in a clean place, maybe somebody living um, overseas, and is coming to share a room with you, is coming to stay with you, what do you do? You clean the inside of the house, you clean the surrounding and you make everything so nice so that he will not feel that there is such a major difference from the place he's coming and the place he has come to stay now. But what do you think if um, somebody was coming from uh, overseas and had been living in a clean environment and you just said, okay, welcome, you open the door and um, the peels of banana are in the room and all the peels of onion and uh, your millstone that you are using to grind the pepper has not been washed for the past one week and that is still in the house and you put uh, the bed on one side and the uh, bed sheet that had not been washed for the past uh, one and a half years you put it there and you say welcome you have just arrived now this is the room where you'll stay as long as you are here how many of you know how many minutes they will spend in your house before he goes back not up to five minutes He'll say, well, thank you very much. Um, I'm so happy to see you. Really, I just wanted to see you. And since I've seen your face, that's enough. Goodbye. I'll be writing to you. You may never see him again. Now, what do you think of the Holy Ghost? When the Holy Ghost is coming right from heaven, from the streets of gold, from the midst of the angels, what do you think of the Holy Ghost? When he's going to come, you think he'll just want to have the banana peels in your heart, all the evil things in your heart, all the dirty things in your heart. Oh no, he wants you to be saved. He wants you to be sanctified. He wants the accommodation, the room you are preparing for him. He wants that place to be clean and tidy. He wants all your sins to have been forgiven. And he wants that heart to be sanctified and cleansed. And then he will come in. And you know, if that place is clean, if that place is really clean, he wouldn't mind to stay in your heart forever. He wouldn't mind at all. If that place is well prepared, if that place is conducive to the Holy Ghost, he wouldn't mind to remain forever. And uh, that is what the Lord has promised us, that when the Holy Ghost has come, he will abide with you forever. But if you want it to be like that, then be saved first, be sanctified, and then the Holy Ghost will come. And when the Holy Ghost came upon them, they spoke with tongues. And uh, we're told in verse 48, and he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. That is, they were baptized in water. And he then prayed they him to tarry certain days. He stayed with them certain days. Now, something was happening back in Jerusalem. Please understand. It was all a new experience. And did you know this, my brother, my sister? Human beings are negative to change. 
human beings like as it was, so it is, so shall it ever be. Human beings like to continue the same direction, like to do the same thing day after day. Human beings do not like change. And my brother, my sister, after you are born again, after you are saved, if you are not uh, crucifying this old nature, if you are not uh, just saying, oh Lord, here am I, daily self-denial, daily looking into the word of God, daily um, looking at the word of liberty, uh, at this glass, the mirror of the word of God, if you are not daily doing that, even your human life, even your human nature will not like change. Now, listen to this. The children of uh, God here, uh, they started in Jerusalem, as I told you, and they went into Judea. That was still all right for them to go into Judea. After all, the people in Judea, they were mainly Jews. And even Samaritans, those Samaritans um, were sort of half-breed people. So uh, they were Jews, even though they had mingled with the Gentiles, yet they still remembered that um, our father said in this mountain we worship, and you Jews said we must come over to Jerusalem and worship. Uh, they still had some link with the Jewish people, even though they were half-breed. But the Gentiles, oh, they were so far away. In language, in culture, in their diet, in their appearances, about circumcision, on the marks of their body, in everything, they were totally different. And now, um, the gospel was, be, was to be taken to the Gentiles. God had already planned it. And God had spoken to Peter. And God had spoken to uh, Cornelius as well. And now the work had been done. But in Jerusalem, they got, they got wind of the news. They got an idea about the story. And you know, they were asking one another, Did you hear what I heard? I heard that Peter, Apostle, our respected honored Apostle, uh, I heard that he's not in Jerusalem at present and, um, and it's not that he went to supervise the churches in Judea or Samaria. What am I hearing? I'm hearing that he has gone into the Gentiles. Gentiles? Where will he lay when he doesn't have any accommodation there? Does it mean he's living with them? How about eating? How will he eat? Now please be patient. Understand. These Jews, since they were born, they had never done anything like that before. Anything like that before. And because of that, it was totally strange to them. That's why the Lord was patient with them until this time. But God will not be waiting indefinitely because souls were there to be saved. And God will really have to just um, go against their tradition, against their bigotry, against their background, and he will just have to do what he has to do. And he picked out just one of them, just one of them, just Peter, the apostle. He showed him the revelation. He didn't show James, he didn't show John, he didn't show any of the other apostles, just uh, Peter. And now the work had been done. And now Peter came back. When Peter came back, the account we see today is the account of what happened when they called him into question. And uh, brothers and sisters, this actually is the first time that you'll read about that. And um, theologians tell us that between this time and the day of Pentecost, seven to eight years have already passed. Some people say seven years, some people say eight years. Doesn't really matter, seven or eight years, less than ten years. And uh, they said all this while they had been going on smoothly except the little problem in Acts chapter 6. But now in Acts chapter 11, we have a problem. And you know, I'm sort of happy that all these things are recorded in the Bible because they solved their problems. And uh, if along the way in our church too, we have any problems similar to this, now we see how they solve the problem here. And um, this will be a good way to solve the problem as well. Acts 11 verse 1. And the apostles and brethren that were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. And when Peter was come up to Jerusalem, they that were of the circumcision contended with him. Now they waited until he came. And uh, when he came to Jerusalem, those of the circumcision, you can put some um, quotation marks around the circumcision because it means a group of people. 
those who believe that before you could enter into the church and actually be part of the church, you must be circumcised. In a way, it is become a Jew first before you become a Christian. Become circumcised before the blood of Jesus Christ will be able to wash you and wash you clean, wash you whiter than snow. And you have to go through uh, the avenue of um, the Jewish synagogue before you really come into the church. That was what they thought. And because of that, they were waiting for Peter, these uh, Christians, believers in Jerusalem. And uh, they contended with him. The word contended there is, um, you know, in the original, very, very strong. And uh, it doesn't mean, uh, you know, they, con they just asked a question and they thought. It means they were contending. They were asking over and over, which means uh, Peter sat down. Somebody asked, and uh, uh, before Peter could be able to give an answer, um, another person replied, you really mean it, Peter, that that is where you are coming from? And before he could give a yes or a no, another person said, no, you don't mean it. You couldn't have done that. And before, another, before he could give an answer, saying, well, let me explain to you, let me explain to you. Somebody else said, no, I, I, I'm, I'm still to hear. If that is true, I think I have lost my respect for Peter. And before he could make a, an answer to that, another person said another thing again. Now, the Greek means, you know, just contending and contending and contending. But we thank God because Peter was a real man of God. He allowed them to ask all those questions. Now, in verse 3, saying, Thou wentest into men uncircumcised and did eat with them. Now you know actually, sometimes when you hear of what some Christians ask questions about, it surprises you. And sometimes you wonder, don't we have greater things to do? Are there not more important things to do than to be asking about Peter going to eat with the Gentiles? What's the matter with eating with the Gentiles? Just food into the mouth. Before Jesus Christ went, didn't he say, it is not what comes into your mouth that makes you unclean, that makes you an unbeliever, but what comes out of your mouth? Christians in Jerusalem, what are you saying? What's the matter with you? Are you more concerned about food that enters than what goes out of the mouth? You know, it was a real problem. And uh, you know, today too, sometimes... When the Lord is moving, when the Lord is working, you are surprised about questions that people ask. Of course, my brother, my sister, it's legitimate when you have a question to ask a question. You know, I heard of a church in America that broke because of wearing time. You know, I'm surprised that in a place like America, a church could divide, a church could just break apart because some people decided they were going to be wearing time. I'm so surprised about that. Here we wear tie and we have not broken up yet. So we are better than those people over there. Not all of them, but some of them. But you see, they were wondering about uh, eating. And uh, Peter here said uh, in verse 4, now he rehearsed the matter. But you know, I thank God for something. After they contended and asked questions, then they kept quiet. They allowed Peter to talk. At least they were good enough. They were not going to bury Peter until he died. And they were not going to cut off his head until he had an opportunity to be able to make an explanation and tell them actually what had happened. And we're told he rehearsed the matter. He repeated the matter from the beginning and expounded it by order unto them, saying, Brethren, when that vision came to me, I was just like you are. And then he said in, in his own words in verse 5, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision, a certain vessel descend, and as it had been, a great sheet let down from heaven by four corners, and it came even to me. Upon the which when I had fastened mine eyes, I considered and saw four-footed beasts of the earth, and wild beasts, and creeping things, and fowls of the air. And I heard a voice saying unto me, Arise, Peter, slay, and eat. Please look up here. Now you know, as you study the Bible, you, you ought to be able to put yourself in, in such a church and ask yourself, suppose I was in the early church. Suppose you were there. And suppose all your life you had never eaten a, a particular type of thing. Suppose all your life you had never gone into the Gentiles. All your life you had never gone into that direction. 
And now Peter was the same. All the others were the same. And then he began to tell this vision. Isn't there this temptation from some of the people to say, No, I don't believe that is God. I don't believe that is God. I believe that's the devil. You know, if anybody was there and he said that, you know what he'll be saying? He'll be putting the work of God right in the bosom, in the hand of the devil. You know, if he said, well, it is true you might have seen revelation. It is true you might have seen a vision. But I don't believe that vision is coming from God. I believe that vision you have seen that told you, arise, kill, and eat. Things that are common, things that are unclean. I believe that is the devil. You know what that person will be doing? That person will be attributing the work of the Holy Ghost to the devil. And what a dangerous sage to sit upon. What a dangerous thing. If Peter will open his mouth and say, Brethren, listen, I was in my own house in the city of Joppa. And this is a vision that I saw. It came from God. And as he related that thing coming from God, you better have the Spirit of God in you to discern that is actually coming from God. You better shut your mouth and not uh, open your mouth to, to say, It is of the devil. Because you have read it in Acts chapter 10 that that thing was from God. And you better believe it. You better take it. It is from God. Because you know, if you could open your mouth and say, No, I don't believe it. It's of the devil. I'll be afraid for you. I'll be afraid for you. Because Jesus told those Pharisees, he said, beware, beware. When he was casting out devils by the Spirit of God, and he was saying, it is by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. He said, hmm, you better be very careful because you are going near the sin against the Holy Ghost. But you know, in that congregation, when Peter rose up and said, brethren, this is what God said, then they didn't say any other thing. They believed it was the Lord. And you know, it will be wonderful to you when we believe our pastor, when we believe the man of God here. Somebody challenged me and said, Why do they call you man of God? I smiled and said, What do you want them to call me, man of the devil? <laughs> what do you want them to call your pastor? To call him man of the devil? No, a pastor is man of God. And you know, when the man of God, your pastor, when he rises up and he says, Thus says the Lord. Now, if you don't understand, it's all right to ask questions. But not to contend to the point that even when we show you the revelation and the leading of the Holy Ghost, that um, you will, you know, go to the other side and say, No, I don't believe it. You must believe what the Spirit is saying. Let's go on. And um, in verse 7, And I heard a voice saying unto me, Arise, Peter, slay and eat. And I said, Not so, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has at any time entered into my mouth. But the voice answered me again from heaven, What God has cleansed, that call not thou common. Now, brothers and sisters, they had forgotten what Jesus had told them before. And uh, they had forgotten that Jesus died for everybody, and somebody must take the gospel to the Gentiles. But, uh, you know, as I read this scripture, and I prayed and said, Oh Lord, you are great. Because, you know, if you look at the church today, there is no Christian testimony right now today in Jerusalem as it was in those days. Where is the Christian testimony major now? Where is it loudest now? Where is it strongest now? In the Gentile world, America is part of the Gentile world, Europe is part of the Gentile world, Africa is part of the Gentile world, Asia is part of the Gentile world. But you go to Israel today, uh, it's uh, people from America, from Europe and other parts of the world who are making a tour uh, to see the grave, the sepulchre of Jesus Christ, to see the Mount of uh, Calvary and to see the various places that are written about in, um, in the Synoptic Gospels. But today, there is no stirring testimony of the Christian faith among the Jews. And yet, think about it. If the Jews of the early days, if they had said, well, only for the Jews, there will be nothing in the Gentile world, think of what it will be today. There will be darkness all over. Think about all the, where the Bible is printed today on Gentile ground. Think about where seminaries and colleges of um, Bible, um, or Bible training centers, where they are today, in Gentile land. 
Think of where the Holy Ghost is moving today. The sick being healed and the lame being uh, healed and the deaf hearing and the blind seeing and every spectacular thing happening in the Gentile world. Think of where you are hearing about church growth that you have a single church up to 500,000 in a Gentile location of the world. Think of all the things going on in the world in Christianity. Where do we have dynamic Christianity growing faith today in the Gentile world, right in Jerusalem and all those places um, around Palestine? At present now, there is not that dynamic testimony to the Christian faith. And yet, when it started, when it started, the Christians in Jerusalem, you know, they didn't understand. And if Peter had not uh, quieted them down, to tell them, brethren, don't let us uh, hinder the move of the Holy Ghost. Where would we be today, my brother, my sister? Let's think of the future generation. You know, my brother, my sister, some of the things that church people may argue about today, if we just uh, pocket our arguments, if we just forget our argument and we say, the will of the Lord be done, you don't know. Tomorrow, if Jesus tarries, they may be the things that will bring millions and millions and millions of people unto the Lord. Think about it. The great names you have heard, John Wesley, Charles G. Finney, C. H. Spurgeon, Billy Graham, were they Jews? No, Gentiles. Suppose the gentle outreach, gentle evangelization had been stopped at this time. What would have happened? Oh, the world would have been in darkness long, long ago. Long, long ago. My brother, my sister, when the Holy Ghost is moving, we may not understand, we may not see the details of what things are going on. Don't let bigotry, background, or culture, or whatever we're doing before, or the reaction to change, don't let that hinder us. Let us move on with the spreading of the gospel. And it says in, um, in verse 11, And behold, immediately there were three men already come unto the house where I was, sent from Caesarea unto me. And the Spirit bade me go with them, nothing doubting. The Spirit bade me go with them, nothing doubting. You know, many years ago when we started, 1973, August the 3rd, at the University of Lagos, we used to call it Flat 7. Later it became Block 12, Flat 2. And we started uh, this gospel. You know what we used to say? We used to say there will be no Sunday fellowship. All we want to do is just to teach people Bible every Monday and every Thursday. And you know we were right. We were sincere. We were faithful. That's the limit of what the Lord had told us at that time. And we went on like that all over this nation. We preached the gospel. We taught the doctrine. We went on retreat. We did everything you can think about. We did it in colleges and universities almost everywhere. And then in 1982, the Lord began speaking to me. Of course, the Lord didn't speak to everybody about it. And 1982, November, the Lord spoke to my heart that, uh, well, just uh, begin Sunday worship. And November 7th, 1982, we started the first uh, Sunday worship here with about 3,407. And all the other people outside deeper life, oh, they said it's of the devil. It's of the devil. God has not spoken to them. And you know I was almost uh, slaughtered with the knife of criticism by all those pastors. Uh-huh, we told those people, ah, human beings. Human beings are clever. Huh? It was said, no Sunday worship, no Sunday worship. Look at them now. We told you. And some of our members, oh, they shook and they trembled. And uh, some of them came to me and said, Brother, uh, uh, what, have, what we have told people before that there will be no Sunday fellowship? And I said, the Lord spoke to me. And he couldn't answer again. He said, okay. You said, the Lord spoke. Check up again. I said, not necessary. The Lord spoke to me. Look at where we are today, my brother. From 1982 to this place, Four services every Sunday. The revival that came on Thursday. Have we just started preaching healing? Didn't we preach healing in every one of our retreats since 1975, December? Every faith clinic. Didn't we talk about faith, dynamic faith? 
why didn't this revival spring up? And the Lord waited until we could obey and start Sunday worship. Today, aren't you convinced that our doing, our having Sunday worship is of the Lord? Answer me. Are you not convinced? Of course you are convinced. Because you have seen the outcome, you have seen the fruit. But you know those days, it took faith on your part, faith in God and faith in leadership to say, well, we know our brother. He has been teaching us not to tell lies. He won't tell lies on God. If he said God said, God must have spoken to him. We don't understand everything. We don't know about everything. But if God has said so, who are we to hinder God? And you know, I appreciate uh, all the attitude that our members had at that time. And December, uh, we called all our state representatives together. If I remember correctly, December, about a fifth to seventh of December, 1982. And um, I brought it to them that already we have started Sunday worship in, um, in Lagos here, in November. And uh, I threw it to them, I said, God said... Now, normally, many of them in the various states, they had preached and they had said, anytime, somebody told me later that he said, anytime this deeper life starts, Sunday worship, it will live deeper life. And the person came to me and said, brother, this is what I have said to other people before. What shall I say now? I said, you go and tell them you are not God. All you said, you said as a human being. He found it difficult. But you know, at that time, his fellowship was just about 200 and then I said my brother listen to leadership listen to leadership God has said it go and do it this is the word of the Lord he went away and he started you know what happened right now that fellowship in that town where they were just about 200 at that time they are now going to 1000 that's the Lord a brother came from Ghana, and he won't mind if I just use this in my preaching for, for your education, for your admonition. And I said, hey, my brother in Ghana, you know, we have done all this in Nigeria here. We have gone in Sunday worship. And uh, the Lord is saying, this is for deeper life. Go and do it. Oh, he said, brother, Ghana is different. That if we do it all, the people will scatter. I said, thus says the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Do it. And he said, well, I don't understand, but uh, you've taught us, according to the Bible, to be obedient to leadership. I will do it. And uh, he went. And you know, at that time, their fellowship was less than 300. You know what now? Right now, they have built their own church building. And right now, they are more than 1,000. And uh, apart from the Catholic church in Kumasi, Deeper Life is the next largest church in Kumasi town. Think about it. It is wonderful to be obedient to the Lord. And in this church, we have been obedient to the Lord. And I'm praying that we'll continue to obey the Lord in Jesus' name. Amen. And so Peter rehearsed all this matter before them. And then he said in, um, in verse 11, Behold, immediately there, there were three men already come unto the house where I was, sent from Caesarea unto me. And the Spirit bade me go with them, nothing doubting. Moreover, these six brethren accompanied me, and we entered into the man's house. And he showed us how that he had seen an angel in his house, which stood and said unto him, Send men to Joppa, and call for Simon, whose son name is Peter. Who shall tell thee what, whereby thou, uh, where, whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved? And as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on, on them, as on us at the beginning. Then remembered I the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized of the Holy Ghost, for as much then as God gave them the same like gift as he did unto us, who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I that I, I could withstand God? And when they heard these things, they held their peace. In any church, there would always be times that we will need to ask questions. Please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that whenever we're doing anything you don't understand, that there is anything in scripture that says you must keep quiet, never, never ask a question. No, the Bible doesn't say that. We're children of God, we're not living under fear. If there's anything the church is doing, anything whatever, any program whatever, that you don't understand, you must ask. But you know how to ask? In a gentle attitude, in a mild attitude, 
not in an attitude of knowing more than your pastor because you don't not in an attitude of being right and your pastor is wrong because it is not so but you know you ask uh, with a mind of wanting to understand you ask with a mind of wanting to appreciate what the spirit of lord is leading us to do and you know when peter explained they held their peace that was wonderful we shouldn't wait arguing on a minor point for one year, for two years, for five years. If we do that, we'll not be able to launch out and do the work we ought to do. What, whatever problem there is, settle it and ask questions about it. And once the answer is given from the Bible and from the leading of the Lord, let's brush that aside and march on. And that's what they did. When they heard these things, they held their peace and they glorified God saying, then hath God also to the Gentiles granted uh, repentance unto life. Now, the Lord has spoken all this to us today so that whenever we have any problem in the church or anything you don't understand, you will know that it's just like it was in Bible days. But if we have a problem similar to the problem of Bible days, we should also have a solution similar to the solution of the Bible days. The same problem, then the same solution. And uh, in all things, they kept to the unity in the church. And it's wonderful when in the church we can keep united. And in this church, this is what we have enjoyed since we started. Since we started this deeper Christian life ministry, we have enjoyed wonderful unity among all our workers, among all our members. There have been unity. Unity on doctrine, unity in our practices, unity in our methodology, unity in the things that the Lord has been leading us to do. And we have been enjoying uh, the great manifestation of the Holy Spirit in our midst. Now look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. That's Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3. Endeavoring. That word endeavor means you do your best. You do your best. You labor um, intently, diligently to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. That is, if there is any time that uh, your flesh will say, I disagree, you call your flesh back and say, no, no room for disagreement. If there is any time that some thoughts, sharp thoughts, terrible thoughts are coming, saying, I disagree, you, know, you say, no, you, you can't disagree. That's the man that preached unto us salvation and I got saved. That's the man that talked to us about sanctification. I didn't know that before. In all the churches where we were going, and I got sanctified. That's the man that talked to us about the baptism in the Holy Ghost. And he taught us that doctrine so diligently, uh, so conscientiously, until we now understood. Therefore, you thought you cannot have time to disagree. Now, that's the man that took us to retreats all over this nation. And uh, we studied Bible. We had seminar. We had messages until we understood what the Bible calls worldliness. And we flee away from worldliness. We fled away from worldliness. And uh, if that man is um, close to God enough to get us saved and sanctified and baptized in the Holy Ghost and get us healed and get all these manifestations of the Holy Spirit helping the church and the church is growing, there is no room for my heart, for my thoughts to, be, to come into disagreement. I will just have to endeavor, endeavor, do my best and labor um, diligently to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Because after all, there is one body. My brother, my sister, there is one body. There is one body and one spirit. Even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, let's keep it so. One faith, let's make it so. One baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. What's the Spirit telling us tonight? Let's remain one. Let's remain one. One, And by the grace of God, that is possible. Is that possible? Yes. <laughs> you know, I heard of a church in Korea. I've never been there. Some of our people have been there. Some of our members here, some of our leaders here, they have been there. You know how large that church is? 500,000. You know how many services they have on one single Sunday? Seven services. And how many people, they just um, the auditorium, their building will take more than 40,000 at one sitting. 
and uh, they have a great network of house fellowship as large as there, 500,000. Almost bigger than uh, some cities, large cities even in Nigeria here. All members of the same single church and they remain under one pastor. Think about it. Unity. We are not many here. How many are we? And I believe that even if we become 500,000 or 1 million or 5 million or any number, the Holy Spirit will convert through us and teach through us, we can remain one in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'll do your part and I'll do my part and we all remain humble together, we can be one. All over Nigeria, all over Africa, and anywhere in the world where Deeper Christian Life Ministry is mentioned, we can be one. Rise up and let us pray. You thank the Lord for what he has taught us tonight. You do your part. You love your church, this church. Love your father in the Lord, your pastor. Keep the body together. You have anything against the pastor, why not write a letter to him? Been trying to see the pastor for a long time, that is difficult. And that is giving you some inconvenience. Why not write a letter to him? Tell your complaint. In a good way. Let's keep united. Let's keep in love together. And when there are questions to ask, let's ask those questions with a free mind. 